God's eternal son. Test one, two, three. Test one, two, three. Test one, two, three. Test. Get through. Set. <laughs> Hello. Turn it down a little bit. <laughs> Matthew chapter ten. Matthew chapter 10. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we do thank you for this time of fellowship. We commit this time to you. Father, as we gather ourselves together to receive wisdom and truth, which is found in your word, we thank you that you would bless us, Lord God, that this word would go forth with clarity and understanding and plant in our hearts and minds truth and life and light, God, which is found in your word. We thank you for blessing our fellowship. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Matthew chapter 10 and verse 1, it says, And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now the names of the 12 apostles are these. The first is Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother, and James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the publican, James the son of Alphaeus and Lebius, whose surname is Th was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into the city of the Samaritans enter ye not. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the leopards, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely you have received, freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purse, nor script for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet a stave or a knife. For the workman is worthy of his meat. And into whatsoever city or town you enter, inquire who it is worthy, and there abide till you go thence. And when you come into his house, salute it. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if, not, if, if, if it's not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words when you enter, depart out of the house, shake off the dust from your feet. Amen. And so here we see it's the beginning. I mean, we Jesus is, is launching out into ministry, and we see the 12, this, he calls it the disciples, but it's the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And I read all of this because I want you to see these 12, when, when you look at Jesus, there, you know, there were the 12 apostles, the 12 were the 12 closest to him. Uh, when you look at the Bible, it says that there were disciples, which are disciplined believers. There were followers, which just, you know, basically followed. And then there were, you know, the apostles. These 12 traveled wherever he went. Anytime you see him walking on the water, they're there, right? Raising the dead, they're there. Opening blind eyes, they're there. No matter where he went, these 12 for over three years followed him everywhere he went, right? And we name our children after them, right? Everybody know a Peter, right? And a Simon and a, and a Bart, right? And a John, I mean James. We, we name our kids after these guys, right? But there's one of them you'd never name your kid after, right? You'd never name your kid Judas, ever, right? Unless you wanted a really tough kid. You would never name him Judas, because when you say Judas, what do you think? Evil, right? It's like saying Adolf, right? Or, or, or uh, uh, you know, <laughs> now, now, calm down. <laughs> but 
but but you 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 know it re, you recoil because of the evil, right? And, and so, but but this Judas was there from the beginning. He worked in the church every day. He went out. He was empowered. Jesus. The Bible says that Jesus gave them the twelve power. All twelve gave the twelve power to go out. So he was there during every turn and twist in the ministry. He, was, he worked in the ministry. He attended church in the ministry. He was part of the ministry. He was a treasurer in the ministry. Yet when you look at it, we're going to see today that he didn't make heaven. So going to church and working in a ministry and working every day tirelessly alongside your pastor doesn't get you to heaven. I mean, think about that for a second. I mean, we, we never... We read it, we see, right? We watch the movies, we read our Bible, but we have to glean something from this guy who was there with Jesus all the time, how he did not make it to heaven. Isn't that a fair question? Well, I'm glad you asked because we're going to start a series today and it's called Self-Deception and True Salvation. And we're going to talk over the next four, five, six weeks, and we're going to do a complete study on salvation, a complete understanding, because this is one subject you don't want to get wrong. I mean, who cares if you get the rapture wrong? Pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, pre-wrath, who cares, right? Who cares if, you're, if, if prayer is wrong or, or, or your doctor may be wrong on, on you know, grace? Understand something. This sin or this, you know, misfortune, there's no turning back from. This is it. I mean, you, you, you really find out, unfortunately, you find out after you take your last breath. That's when you find out if you had it right or you had it wrong. But the Bible makes it very clear what salvation is. And so, you know, first of all, I want you to see, I want you to understand, and I want to build a little bit of facts about you. Just go over to uh, Mark chapter 14. Mark 14. Let's look at what Jesus said about Judas. Now, we call him the betrayer, right? Okay, he betrayed Jesus about 24 hours before he died, right? He's the one who led his real, his, what he did for the 30 pieces of silver was he led the, the high priest uh, uh, guards in and gave them an opportunity when the crowds weren't around Jesus. So he told him where he retreated in the evening, and that's what he got paid for, okay? But we're going to see today that Judas did not intend Jesus to be killed. He didn't even intend. He tells them to lead him away safely, keep him under guard, keep him safe as you take him away. So it wasn't his intent to do him harm. We're going to see that. But what I want you to know, in the same 24-hour period, while Judas is betraying Jesus, what's Peter doing? He's denying him. Same 24-hour period. While Judas is betraying Jesus, Peter's betraying Jesus because he ne- he's on trial. He needs character witnesses, and, G- and, and Peter is denying him. So there's a difference between these two men who walked with Jesus for these three plus years, and we have to know or we should be able to glean from it what that difference is over the next few weeks so that we can be sure we know we're on track or we know we better get on track. And the first thing I can tell you before we even start, salvation in heaven is not a birthright. It doesn't matter who your parents are. It doesn't matter where your parents go to church. It doesn't matter what your parents believe. It doesn't matter what your pastor believes. It doesn't matter what you've been taught. All that really matters is what we can read in the scripture to tell us what's right and wrong. Amen? I have seven children. All seven will have to make their own decision for Christ. Not because they follow me to church. Not because they they help here at the ministry. All seven will have to make their own decision in their life to become a believer in Jesus Christ. Amen? First of all, let's look at Judas, just a couple of things about him. In Mark chapter 14, (coughs) and let's look at verse 17. 
It says, and in the evening he cometh with the twelve. So notice who's with him, the twelve. And as they sat and did eat, Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, one of you which eats with me shall betray me. And they began to be sorrowful and to say unto him, One by one, Is it I? And another said, Is it I? And he answered and said unto them, It is the one of the twelve that dippeth with me in the dish. The Son of Man indeed goeth as it is written of him, but woe to that man whom the Son of Man has betrayed. Good were it for that man if he had, what, never been born. In other words, he doesn't have salvation. But here's the other revelation here. Now, they're living together, traveling together, the 13 of them, along with a mass of people wherever they go. But when Jesus poses this question to them, they couldn't pull him out of a lineup. He looked like a believer. He fit in. He worked in the ministry. They didn't say, well, it's Judas, right? I would have said Peter because Jesus already identified Satan with Peter, didn't he? Didn't he say, get thee behind me, Satan, right, in, 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 in Matthew's gospel? And so here, not only did Jesus say his fate is hell because he said it's better for him if he'd never been born, but he also can't pick them out of a lineup. They can't, they're questioning who it is. So he had to look the part. Do you guys get that? Do you see that? Over in uh, the same chapter in verse 43, it says, Immediately while he yet spake cometh Judas, one of the twelve, and with him a great multitude with swords and with staves, that's a knife, from the chief priests and the scribes of the elders. And he that betrayed him had given them a token, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same as he, take him and lead him away safely. And the King James safely. In other words, under guard, keep him safe as you lead him, lead him away. You know, whatever, Jesus is, whatever Judas's motives were, I mean, he was a zealot. He may have wanted to move people against, you know, the, the Romans or against the high priest. Whatever his motive was, it wasn't the assassination. Because once he knew... That, that Jesus was going to be crucified. He tried to give the money back. The Bible says that he had great remorse and great shame, and he tried to give the 30 pieces of silver back to the high priest. They took that, and they bought a potter's field with it. In other words, they didn't want to take the dirty money back. And, and, and so in this 24, 48-hour period of time, you know, Judas made a decision to sell out Jesus, to tell the high priest where they could find him. And, you know, we can, we're not doing a study on him, but I, what I, you know, why I opened here is I want you to see, <clears throat> do you think Judas thought that his salvation was secure? Do you think he would have said, boy, when I die, I'm going to hell? Probably not. Probably not. I mean, we, you know, we're going to have to wait to get all the answers. But, but he lived and he went to church, he heard the sermons, he was there and he looked like a believer. And what that tells me is, what that tells me is, we can be deceived as well. We can be deceived as well. Remember, somebody that's deceived, they think they're right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They, they'll fight you for it. I mean, you, you have people, you know, we, we've seen it in the, in the last two decades, giving their lives for their God, killing innocent people, think, having a zeal because they think they're going to heaven because of their actions. They're willing to die, and they believe in their God, and they follow the rules of their God, even though we know it's Satan, and we what? We do the things of our God, but we have a zeal, and that zeal has to be according to knowledge, amen? Well, let's look at what the scripture says. Go over to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. <coughs> Verse 13. It says, Enter ye at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leads unto life, and few there be that find it. Okay, let's stop there. Let's look at these two verses. It says, Enter ye at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, 
And many, there, many, many go, right? Many find that way. He says, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way, which leads unto what? Life or salvation. And few there be that find it. So immediately, we don't have to be a mathematician to understand. He's saying many are not going to make heaven. And few are going to make heaven. So when you look at humanity as a percentage, he's saying that it's going to be a fraction of humanity that's going to make it to heaven. I don't know what that fraction is, and, and I wouldn't even want to guess at it. But, but when, you, when you look at what he's saying here, he's saying it's very narrow. There's only one way, and, that's, and you're going to learn that today, and that's through Jesus Christ. There is no other way to heaven. When you leave this series, I want you to be able to, because we need to be able to explain to the guy next door, to the person across our, our, our dining room table, our kitchen table, we need to tell them why we're saved. We need to tell them why we know we're going to heaven and why they might not be going to heaven. You know, let me ask you this. Just ask, I'm going to ask you a question. Don't answer. Don't raise your hands. But if I said, who is Jesus Christ, how, will you, how do you answer that question? If you had to write me two sentences on who Jesus Christ is, what would you write down? Think it out right now. If you wrote something that didn't make it personal in your life, like he died for me, he's my savior, he's the one who paid for my sins, then you need to be here for the next five weeks. Okay, because that's a litmus test. If you said, well, he died for the sins of the world, you know, something generic and big and bold about other people. Because when you know Jesus Christ and what he did, you know that he took your sins, your iniquities, your transgressions, and he paid the price for you. So you make it personal. When somebody asks you that, you say, he died for me. He died for my sins. He died for my iniquities. He brought me to God, amen? And so that's a litmus test. But here I want you to see as a percentage is few. People say, you know, well, the power of God should, should bring abundance. But I have to tell you, God wins, right? And it's not a matter of numbers. It's not a matter of numbers. It's a matter of hearts that are changed, amen? Let's read the next verse. It says, beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly they are raving wolves. You shall know them by their fruit. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits, you shall know them. Okay, this is, it, it may sound a little odd to you, but probably this is some of the most important, one of the most important subjects that we'll study over the next weeks. And so he goes immediately from many will go to hell and broad is that way, but few will go to heaven and narrow is that way. He goes on to say that there's false prophets or false teachers or false leaders out there he said, you'll know them by their fruit. And let me just identify for you what fruit is because we'll talk about it over the next weeks. Fruit is outward actions. Whenever the Bible says the word fruit, it means outward actions. So you're, you're going to see, in other words, by their outward actions, by not what they say, but how they live and what they do, you'll know them by their fruit. Amen? And so he's saying... When you, when you want to fact check somebody, don't listen to them, watch them, okay? He goes on, verse 21, says, not everyone, listen to this, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord. Now, he's saying not everyone that says to me, so he's making it first person, him, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have you not prophesied in thy name? In thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Okay, when I first came into Christianity, 
there's about four or five uh, different sections of scripture that really set the tone for my walk. And this was one of them. Because here we here Jesus is saying, not everyone that calls me Lord is going to go to heaven. Not everyone that identifies me and says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. He said, only those that do the will of my Father, which is in heaven. He said, many will say to me in that day, that didn't we do this in your name? Didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we do these wonderful works in your name, right? Look what it says. It says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? In your name cast out devils. In your name done many wonderful works. Now, look at what they're saying there. Think about it. They're saying, didn't I do good work for you? That's, aren't they saying that? Didn't I work in the church? Didn't I feed the poor? Didn't I take care of the church? And I, I was a parking lot attendant. I was a greeter. I, was a, I dealt bingo on Friday. <laughs> whatever, whatever you're going to say, what, they don't understand even the fundamental, have a fundamental understanding of who Jesus is in relationship to them. Because the last thing a born-again, spirit-filled believer is going to tell Jesus is how great they are. Isn't that what they're doing there? You're going to say, how great are you, Jesus? Do you see the, the thinking process? This is Judas here. Think about what Judas did. He, he worked. He worked miracles, right? We don't work miracles. God works miracles through us. He used a donkey in the Old Testament, right, to speak to a prophet. So we have no right to say that power is ours. That power is not ours, it's God's. He can use anybody to do anything. It doesn't mean they're going to heaven. Okay, Jesus goes on to say, look at what he says. He says, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Now, what did we say fruit was? Outward actions. So you're going to see fruit is the outward action of God's word. Amen. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name cast out devils in thy name done many wonderful works. So not talking about Muslims here in the name of Christianity, right? He says, then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. What does that mean? I never had a relationship with you. You had a relationship with me in your mind, right? You thought you were doing work for me. You thought you were serving me. You thought you were living for me. You thought you were working in the church. But I didn't have a relationship with you. Key point, okay? So not only, not only are they telling Jesus how great they are and what they did for him. Jesus is telling them, while you were doing all of that, I wasn't even connected to it. I wasn't even connected to it. Think about that. What does this tell us? What, 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 what Self-deception and true salvation. These people, it says, in that day, many will say, Lord, Lord. What day are they talking about? The day of their judgment the day of their judgment. In other words, they lived their whole life on earth thinking they had eternal security, thinking that they were in the know and the other guy was in the wrong. And after they took their last breath, they found out they had a life of deception. And I want you to see the word he uses here. Just look at this. Verse 22. Verse 22. What does it say? Many. Many. Not few. Not there's a few. Many will be deceived. Okay? Verse 24. It says, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will look at them to a wise man which builds his house upon a rock, and the rains descend, the floods came, 
and wind blew and beat upon the house, and it fell not, for it was founded on a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man, which builds his house upon the sand. Rains the said, floods came, winds blew, beat upon the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Amen? In other words, it won't stand up in time. So doing the will of God or doing the word of God builds your life on a solid foundation. Amen? So, so when we back up for this, just understand there's two ways to be deceived. One is you learn wrong in the first place, right? If I teach you something here today and you take it and own it and it's completely wrong, you're now living under the assumption that that's correct. You'll teach other people and they'll teach other people and they'll teach other people. I mean, some of the things that some denominations are doing today were done a thousand years ago and they're still doing them. And they're still not biblical, right? So you learn wrong. And then the second thing is you assume. You assume that's what the scripture means. And, and we, a lot of us rewrite the word of God to fit what we believe, right? One of the most difficult things is to undo someone's doctrine when it's wrong because they've been entrenched in it for a long time. You know, I mean, you, you, you have people, and I, I don't want to touch any denominations, but you, you have people that have their whole lives. I'll, I'll use someone in my own family. I mean, pray to Mary for years and years and years like she's going to do something. She needed salvation as well. You'll learn that next week. You'll learn that next week. So, I mean, so, but, but they deify her, and what does that do? It takes away from Jesus, because he's the only way, right? And so when you get that doctrine built into the church in about 300 AD, and it, and it ripples through for 1,700 years, because, and frankly, here's why. When they went into Constantinople, and they, they eradicated they eradicated all of the gods that they were worshiping and they erected the cross, Constance did. He erected the cross and he, he forced everyone to worship Jesus. He moved, he moved the birth of Jesus to December 25th, which was a pagan holiday, right? So when he went back to see what they had built, they had Jesus, but they had all of these goddesses. So he eliminated them and he set up the, 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 the worship of Mary. He gave them a female to worship. And then here we are, 2015 years, you know, whatever, 2,000 years later, and we're still living under that structure because it was to accommodate a heathen people in Turkey. You know, but, most, but, but think about it. You wake, you're born, you're born into a family that does it. You just do what your family does, right? That doesn't make it right. That's what I want you to see tonight. It doesn't make it right. You have to find out in scripture what is truth, amen? So, so let's go to, uh, go over to Romans chapter 10. Sort of got ahead of myself, but. Yeah, don't, don't write me because of the December 25th. I, we, the world has chosen to worship Jesus in his birth on December 25th, but it was moved there to set, because of the winter solstice, which is December, and it was, it was to eradicate the sun god. And so they made that the birth of Jesus. They moved it to that date, and that's why it's, today it's that date. Today it's that date. So Romans chapter 10 and verse 1, it says, Brethren, my heart's desire... And prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear record, they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, are going about to establish their own righteousness and have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. For Moses described the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, say not in your heart 
who shall ascend into heaven? That is to say, bring Christ down from above. And so Paul is writing here, and it's an important section of scripture. He's talking about the Old Testament saints. He's talking about those that are of the seed of Abraham and Moses and David. He's talking about those that owned an, an, an a, a Old Testament. They had all the scrolls. They studied them all the time. And, you know, think about this for a second. They're, they're studying their whole lives, the Old Testament, right? And it all pointed to the coming of Jesus. Yet when Jesus came, they didn't even know him. They didn't even know who he was. They didn't even know. They thought they were getting someone different that was going to establish the kingdom and power and force. And they didn't even know who he was, yet they had the, the Bible. In fact, those same people are the ones that put him to death, right? These are the ones that own the Bible. These are the ones. So he's saying, my heart's desire for Israel, because he was born, right, a Jew. He says that they might be saved, but they have a zeal for God. They want to serve God. They get up every day and they want to serve God, but it's not according to a big word, knowledge, it's not a, you could say, let me amplify it. It's not according to the word of God. It's not according to truth. It's not according to, to God's doctrine or God's word. Amen. And he goes on to say, Moses described the law and the law was a, a, a structure that they lived under. But the, but the righteousness now by faith is just believing in Jesus Christ. Amen. He goes on then, and this is this you'll hear this many, many times. Verse 8 says, But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, the word of God, the Bible is close to you, even in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. So verse 9 says, That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Three verses, three times, he says, confess something and believe in your heart. You have something in your heart. Verse 8 says, the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. In other words, you have the word of God or possession of the word of God. Someone cannot get saved without knowledge. Okay? You can't just have an emotional experience in a, in a Denny's parking lot. Knowledge, you have to have a knowledge because it says that you have to believe that Jesus died and rose from the dead, which means what? You have to have a knowledge of what he did. Okay? But he says there, he says, the word is close to you. It's even in your mouth and in your heart, the word which we preach. So in other words, you know that, that if you that has the word in your heart, if you confess and it doesn't just say Jesus, what does it say? Lord Jesus. Big, big difference between Jesus and Lord Jesus. Okay. He says, if you confess Lord Jesus and shall believe in your heart, that's not your head. That God, what, has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So the, the resurrection, the death, burial, and resurrection is what we believe in, okay? And, and you're, you're gonna, next week you'll understand why. But understand something. He's not saying a, a head knowledge here. There's a difference between a head knowledge, ripping off two plus two is four, Right? I mean, it's, it's, it's a head knowledge. A heart knowledge means it's at your core. It's in you. It's a part of your fabric. It's not just lip service, but you've had a awakening within you so that your heart is speaking through your mouth. Not your head, your heart. In other words, the core of you says, I believe that he died and rose for me. Amen. It says, for the, for, for, the heart, for the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Amen? So, so really what, what and we're gonna, you're going to see this over the weeks, 
it's not just a knowledge that Jesus lived and died, but what, what did he do? What, what did he do? Why should God forgive you your sins? Why should you be a son of God or a daughter of God? What gives you the right to claim you are? Aren't those good questions? We have to own the answer. You have to, you have to believe that answer so much that it's such a part of your fabric that you know that you know that you know that that is the way you're getting to heaven. Amen? And, and, and we'll go through that. When you go over to, let's go over to James. Go over to James chapter 2. Because we're saved by faith, right? It says believe in the heart, right? Verse 14 says, What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? In other words, what does it profit or what value is it if a man says that he has faith and he has not works or there's no corresponding action to his, to his words, can his faith save him? He's asking a question. There should be a question mark in your Bible, a couple of them actually. It says, if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food and one of you say unto them, depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believes that there is one God, thou does well. The devil also believes and trembles. But will thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son upon the altar? See thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, saying, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he's called the friend of God. You see then how that by works a man justified, and not by faith only. Likewise also, was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when he received the messenger that had sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. Okay? Hold, just hold your finger. Go over to Ephesians real quick. Ephesians 2.8. It says, for by grace are you saved. In other words, it's a gift. By grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Does it seem to contradict? Are you guys there? Ephesians chapter 2, look at verse 8. It says, for by grace are you saved. Grace means unmerited favor. You didn't merit the salvation. You didn't, you can't, you, you, it wasn't, it was a gift to you. You had nothing to do with that gift. It says, for the, by grace or the gift of God, you're saved through your faith. In other words, your faith reaches out and grabs the salvation that's yours and brings it into your life. Not of yourselves, it's a gift from God, not of works. So it's not by works, at least any man should boast, right? So we don't get saved by works. We get saved by faith in the gift of God, okay? Well, what's James saying? James saying, faith without works is dead. Look at verse 17. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. So what the heck? <laughs> well, let me tell you. What James is teaching us is what faith is. True faith in your heart will have a corresponding outward action. Okay? Okay? It's not your outward action that saves you. It's your outward action that tells me that you truly believe in your heart. You understand? You don't work for your salvation. Your faith reaches into heaven. 
and grabs the salvation that's already available to you. So it's not your actions that do it, it's your faith that does it. But your faith, if it's true and it's in your heart, will motivate you to speak and act and move. Do you understand? That's what it means to believe in your heart. In other words, it, it, believing in Jesus Christ as Lord means you're going to change, even if it's ever so subtly, to move toward Christ because now you've made him Lord of your life. You see, faith, you can talk all day long and not do. That's exactly what they were doing in Matthew chapter 7. They, I, my dad used to have a line, going through the motions. They were going through the motions, right? Judas was going through the motions. Do you get it? True faith will move you to action. True awakening, true faith will bring about you acting out your salvation. That's the fruit. Remember he said, what did he say? He said, a false prophet will bring evil fruit actions. A good prophet will bring good fruit or good actions. Okay? So we learn something. It has to be according to God's word. We'll see that. And then that word has to be lived upon. He that hears the will of my father and what? Does them. Do you see how it's connecting? The deceived write their own book. I mean, I, I hate to tell you what people tell me about salvation and, and what they believe in Jesus Christ. But it's all right here. Everything's right here in the, in the word of God. And so the deceived have not spent time picking up the Bible. That's why... You, you need to go to a church that teaches from the Bible. Otherwise, you can never know truth. You can never know the truth without knowing the word of God. Right? So James, just look at it again. Verse 14, it says, What does it profit, my brethren, though a man says he has faith and he has not works? Can faith save him? In other words, can his word save him without actions? It says, if a brother or sister is, is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto him, and depart in peace, be warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Look at the last verse. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. You ever see a dead body, right? I mean, we've all we're old enough to see that, right? You go to a funeral home, there's no life in it. It's not alive, it's not producing, right? That's what he's saying about faith if it doesn't have action. If it doesn't have action, which, which now tells me if we're not going to be deceived, then we have to learn the word of God and do the word of God. I actually, learn the word of God and do the word of God. Otherwise, we're deceived as well. Right? If you go, go over to Mark chapter 7, is any of this penetrating? Yeah. <laughs> verse 6, Mark 7, verse 6. And he answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but what? Their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain they do worship me, teaching for the doctrine the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandments of God, ye hold the traditions of men as of washing of pots and cups and many other such things you do. And he said unto them, Full well you reject the commandment of God, that you may keep your own traditions. For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother, and whoso curses thy father or mother, let him, be, let him die. That's a commandment. He said, But you say, If a man shall say of his father or mother, It is Corban, that is to say a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. And you suffer him no more to do aught for his father or his mother, making the word of God of none effect through your traditions, which you have delivered, and many such like things you do. 
And so here he's telling them, he's, and he's talking about the Old Testament. I want you to see here, he's telling them, you've departed from the truth. And here's the, here, you have to get this straight. You have to answer this question. Can God write a book? Right. Can God write a book? Because you're, you're going to get people out there, they're going to say, wow, well, that was written 2,000 years ago. And you'll get people talking about the Old Testament and traditions that they had in the Old Testament. And, and, and they don't believe in God. I believe that God can write a book. In fact, the best way for God to give man, who only lives uh, 80 to 120 years or whatever, 60 to 120 years, a revelation that would go from generation to generation would put it in book form. But God wrote a book. I believe that. So if God wrote a book and he created the sun and the moon and the stars and the things that we're finding out today, DNA, he created all of that for and, and had all that knowledge, right? And he gave us a revelation. What he said that we should do 2,000 years ago still goes today, right? We, but we change it, and that's what he's saying here. What, the Bible says that, that honor your mother and father. Okay, let me give you some background here. And, and it's, it's the first commandment with, with promise was to honor your parents. And here it's saying they changed the law because when Jesus came, the law had expanded three times its size. There were like 600 new laws uh, from, from what was given to Moses. And basically you can abandon your parents if you give the money to the church. That's what that's saying. It's Corbin, it's a gift. So your parents can't earn anymore, but you don't give them the money. You give it to the church. You can now bypass that commandment. You've satisfied that commandment. It's, you know, that, that, that's what they wrote. And so what Jesus is saying, you make the word of God of none effect because now they follow that tradition. It's what I told you before, right? So now you, what I want you to glean from this is when you learn from me or anybody else that stands in front of you with a microphone and gives you the word of God, the burden to find out if it's true or not is on you. Just because somebody puts out a sermon on Sunday and gets you all tingly, or I give you a word tonight and, and you hear it tonight, I'm telling you, don't trust any of it. Go verify it for yourself because you're the one who's going to live and die with it. Do you understand? Because again, it ripples through. It ripples through. Go, go to Genesis chapter 3. And we'll look at this next week, but I want you to see this. Gen Genesis chapter 2 first, verse 15. It says, the Lord God took the man, put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to, and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden that thou mayest eat freely or freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, then thou shalt what? Surely die. Or literally by the first death, you'll experience the second death. So God tells man, Eve's not created yet. He tells man, you know, here's the garden. You can go anywhere, do anything. It's all yours. But this one tree in the center, do not eat from this tree in the center. Okay, it's not an apple tree. It's, it calls it the tree of good and knowledge, right? Good and evil. So it's a tree, okay? In chapter 3 and verse 1, it says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of the trees of the garden." The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst or the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. The serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. Well, let's look at what Satan does. Because here, there's only one way to heaven, that's through Jesus Christ, right? When we confess Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, God becomes our Father, right? So if you're not in the body of Christ, so God's your Father, then everyone else 
their father is Satan. Their spiritual father is Satan. So if you're not, and you don't belong to God, if you're not saved, if you're not a born-again believer, and you believe in Jesus Christ with your heart, where God is your father, then everyone else is Satan's. Because everyone else is where, where are they going when they die? Right? We have to believe in hell if we believe in heaven. Right? So what does Satan do here? Look at what he does here. Because he's still doing it today. God gave a commandment. If you do this, you're going to die. If you do this, there's consequences. If you do this, this is what's going to happen to you. If you disobey my word, this is the result of your life and the judgment that will come into your life. What does Satan do? He tells them, disregard what God said. Completely disregard it. You're not going to die. Do you see that? Well, what did, what did the Jews do? You can dishonor your parents. You can give it to the church as a gift and you can dishonor your parents. Isn't that what they did? Whose voice is that? It's not God's. You guys see that? It's the same thing today. It's the same thing today. Teaching that, teaching that there's no consequence to actions, teaching that you can live the way you want to live, teaching you can believe the way you want to believe, teaching that you can go through life making your own rules, teaching that you can disregard the Bible because it's the year 2016. Let me tell you something. Three verses later, they ate of that tree, and that's the reason we need salvation today because they disobeyed that word. It's the same today, saints. You can't just, I don't care what's socially acceptable. I don't care what they think is tolerant or not tolerant. I don't care what the president does or says. I don't care what the pope says or does. It doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is God's word and understanding it and knowing it. Otherwise, you will fall into a trap and you will fall into a bad place because God can only bless his word, amen? Do you get it? Do you see it? I mean, it's, it's the first, you know, next week we're gonna study exactly why we needed the virgin birth, exactly why we needed salvation, exactly why, because again, I believe that we should not be superficial in our understanding. You should be able to explain why, what, where, when, and how so that it's not superficial. You have it inside your spirit to know what is God or what isn't God or what's right or what's not right. You understand? Otherwise, we can be in deception as well. We can be in deception as well. It's, it's extremely important today because there is so much noise out there. There's so much changing of the word of God. I mean... And, and, and some of the more difficult subjects today, I mean, the, 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 you know, if you, if you take a subject that's easy, you know, and, and we've talked about it here, gay marriage. Let's just take gay marriage. A vast majority of self-identified Christians don't know why it's wrong. I mean, think about it. It was Old Testament or New Testament wrong. But, they, you know, bless their hearts, they don't know why. They can't, they can't tell you or verbalize why it's wrong. And that's why they're not what? They're not, they don't have a, a zeal to come against something that is wrong because they don't understand why. Because why? They weren't taught. They weren't taught. The only way you know it's wrong, how do you know it's wrong? Because the Bible tells you why it's wrong. The, tell, the Bible tells you how God created man and woman. The, God, the Bible tells you in Romans chapter one that it's completely wrong, you know, but it's like any other sin. So I don't want to make it like, like it's, 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 it's like any other sin. But how do we know it's wrong? We know it from God's word, amen? That's why we can't have these sound bites. You can't just be superficial. You've got to know why, when, where, and how 
so that you can connect the dots and put it together for somebody and, it, and it's not superficial, but it's real truth, amen? You guys get it? Do you understand it? Do you have questions? I'm gonna take questions in the next few weeks. Anybody? No? Can't be that complete of a message. <laughs> All right, well, let's close down in prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for today. We thank you for this word. We thank you, Father, for this truth. We thank you for our salvation, Lord God. We pray that you'll give us wisdom and knowledge and understanding over the next weeks, Father, to know your word and to bring forth revelation in your word, Father. Father, we thank you for some prayer requests. We pray for Mark who needs healing for a pain in his spine, lower back and hips. Father, we extend our faith toward Mark and we pray, Father, healing into his body. We pray, Father, that you would adjust what needs to be adjusted in his body. We speak to his body and we command his body to line up, Father, as you created him, Father. We, cause, we pray that this pain would leave him. We pray that he would walk, Father, and be totally mobile in Jesus' name. Pray for Sarah for salvation and Michael for salvation. Father, we pray, Father, that as you uh, cause Paul, Father, on the road of Damascus, Father, to be encountered by you, Lord, we pray that you would encounter Sarah and Michael, that you would encounter them in such a way, Lord God, where they would have an undeniable experience of the reality of you, God, to know that you're real, to know that you're alive, to know that you know where they're at, Lord God. Break into their lives, God. You can't, you can't make a decision for them, Lord, but you can make circumstances that would cause them to see you. We pray today in Jesus' name that you would cause a situation for them to see you, a circumstance where they would see you and know you, Father, in Jesus' name. We pray for Leon and Tina for healing and Leon and, and for his marriage. Lord God, we pray for this couple, Father, who has drifted apart. Lord God, we pray that you would ignite, Father, the love they had at the first. Father, we pray that you would break down the walls, the deception, the, the strife, the division. Father, we pray that you would encounter them, Lord God, touch them individually and touch them as a couple. Father, touch their lives, Father, open their eyes, Father. Don't allow Satan to build a wall between them. Tear it down, Father, in Jesus' name and cause them to see the love that they had at the first one for another. And Father, we pray for Leon, we pray for complete healing. And we pray, Father, that you would restore this marriage, Lord God, encounter this marriage, encounter this couple in Jesus' name. Father, we pray your blessings upon them. Lord God, we give you glory, we give you praise, we give you honor, we thank you so much, we love you so much. Father, we thank you for our salvation. And Father, over the next weeks, Father, we pray that you would move on hearts and minds of our friends and family, Father, to come and to receive those that might not know you, Father, those that live in deception, Father. We pray, Father, in Jesus' name, that you would draw them to this place to hear this word. Father, we give you glory and praise and honor in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, this week is going to be the our end times message at Community Christian Church. We didn't do it last week because it was right after the first. So Community Christian Church, 10 o'clock this Saturday. On Ryan, right, it's on Ryan. God bless you.